Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces. Man, we are at the final We're at chapter. The end of book one. I can't believe how fast it happened. I know, I know. It feels like everything has just like shot by so so quickly, so quickly, um, which has just been, it's just been so much fun the entire time. So it has. Far. Yeah, like, I've been absolutely loving this so far. I am so excited to jump into chapter uh, chamber of secrets next. I, I know. I yeah. know. Yeah, like a whole new book. We're going to have to go buy like new copies for, for Mark. I know. I was just thinking that I was like, normally we do these like, we'll like record a bunch of episodes like all at once. And I was like, you know what? We don't even have the second book to, I know, to yeah, read we, to we, mark up. We can't do more work right now. <laughs> can't do more. Um, um, I will say though that heading into chamber of secrets, I do want to make an announcement here as part of the, uh, the start of the finale episode of book one is that um, as of here, January 2024, Happy New Year, we have just launched a brand new um, project called our Wizarding Candle Club. Yes, the Wizarding yes. Candle subscription Yes, this uh, is, gonna is now be, available. Yeah, so we've been working on this for a while, and the way it's going to work is that um, we have uh, just a, basically a monthly candle subscription, and each, uh, so every month you'll get a brand new mystery, magically scented candle, something inspired by the wizarding world. So um, month one, since we're heading into Chamber of Secrets right now, we thought there was a pretty obvious first candle that we should do. And it's just called Pretty Obvious, and it smells like lilac. And what's really cool about the uh, the candles is that as you burn them, not only are they magically scented, but there's a little bit of magic inside them there as is well. Indeed. Yes, yeah. indeed. So as the candle burns down, you will slowly reveal a, uh, a hidden and collectible charm yes. inside of the candle itself. Yeah, so the uh, each candle has its own unique collectible charm on the inside that you can collect after you burn down the candle. So you have something to look forward to whilst you enjoy the smell. Those are uh, available to sign up. Uh, you can sign up to buy individually or sign up for the whole year, just a few months at a time if you want, whatever. But they're available over at uh, wizardingcandles.com. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. I was so excited. We we, we, we secured a domain name. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that made it feel so real. I know. I was like, wow, this is so neat. This is so fun. Yeah. Yeah, so wizard and candles.com. They are all uh, hand poured <coughs> soy candles. Uh, they burn for it's two wicks, uh, and I believe the burn time is about 130 hours. Yeah, so, they go. Uh, absolutely. Enjoy, enjoy. Be sure to go and check those out. Wizardandcandles.com. But without any further ado, let's step into chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces, where arguably uh, I think the first the first major occasion of my entire life, uh, you know, at age what, what would I have been? Like age eight or nine years old, probably one of the biggest mind-blown moments. I know that it wasn't I had, Snape. I had, I th that it wasn't Snape. That it's Quirrell. That it was Quirrell, yeah. yes. I mean, I mean, the the book sets you up so hard to be Snape. Like, yes. Almost like openly misdirecting you. I mean, uh, most books that have a twist ending are trying to misdirect you. This one, even when you go back and you know what the twist is, it's like, boy, I don't know. They're really pointing you in the wrong direction here. I, well, I, yeah. I was, it's funny that you say that actually, because I was thinking, like, you know, uh, as a kid, you know, like when I had when I had read the book, or then like when I got like further away from it, I was like, I bet it was, I bet it was super obvious that it was that it was like Coral, yeah. the whole time. And then like as as you go through, it's like it's amazing to me how situated he is in each of the instances yeah but how he is just like like the wallpaper of the scene you know it's like you know nobody's really paying attention to like what's like going on back there like you know oh coral fell over when hermione was trying to light snape's robes on fire or whatever it's like you like literally you just don't think twice about it but then once you know to look you're like oh my gosh yes and he's there and then and then he meets him at the at the leaky cauldron the day that the stone is stolen and you know it's just over and over and over again like all throughout the story um it's just so much fun it's it's so cool to like like once you know to like yeah. spot it I mean, he is there, so there are there are clues, but like, yeah, there it, it yeah uh, the the way Snape is positioned too, though it's like what it, it, it is a really good reveal 
when you find out that it's Quirrell and it's like, what? Yes. So um, what do you think of the chapter art here for the man with two faces? I, I like the chapter art. Um, we have in in office, there is an amazing illustration that was done back. Like I think when Think Geek was a company, we would order these posters yeah. of, of each of the various like uh, I think they only ended up doing books one through four, yeah. uh, possibly either before the, the artist decided not to continue doing it or the company went out of business or I have no I don't know what happened. Yeah, but um, there's only four of them. Yes, but the, the the imagery that is used depicts the scene that Harry is currently walking into and I love it because it's basically like, you know, Coral standing before uh, like the mirror but facing Harry but then you can see the reflection of um, Voldemort in, in, the, in mirror. the mirror itself yeah. and I, I really like love that imagery so I I could have stood for more mirror of error said imagery in side of this rather than what we're getting instead, which is just Quirrell sort of like unwrapping his turban. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I do think I was like uh, part of me is like, well, it's a little bit spoilery, isn't it? Like, but it's, I mean, at, at the same rate, though, the first sentence is it was Quirrell. And I mean, it says the man with two face. The chapter title might be a little uh, spoilery, I suppose. If you think you can predict that by two faces, there's a second face coming out of the back of someone's head. I know, but it's also yeah. like it's like it's such a double meaning as well because it's like the idea of being two faced is right. sort of like what Coral has been this whole time. That's like true. He, yeah, no, it's just good. Under, it's yeah. just good. So I, I think it's pretty clever, but um, this is like one of those two where it's kind of interesting because again, when we were kids reading this, um, or rather, our dad was reading it to us, like it's almost the type of thing where he would have concluded. Uh, the chapter for the evening like this. Th this would have been the end of the reading session. For yeah, us. so we would have had this sort of like moment of um, like, oh my gosh, what well, 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 dad, what's going to happen next or whatever. Um, but then like we wouldn't turn the page, right? You know, like you, know, he, he you would, would just be left on. There was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. Yes. Yeah. So right. at that point in time, dad would would fold the corner of the page or whatever and shut the book. And so you wouldn't see. But then now as as like a, you know, more matured reader or whatever, um, even if I was going to end my reading session at the end of the night or at the end of the chapter, you know, you would still turn the page and see like the first line right you know, at which point in time chances are you're not going to sleep anymore right like, you know you're like no, no it was cool what huh okay I'm going to have to know um, in but fact then, including the line in the last or including the phrase it wasn't even Voldemort really throws you off because then you might think oh well the Voldemort's not there right that's true yeah. that's true yeah so that's which isn't totally correct it's just not he just hasn't realized that Voldemort is there Yet. Yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that. <clears throat> the other interesting thing I just have to say real quick before we dive into all the nitty gritty details is the just astonishing fact that this is the last chapter of the book. Um, just simply because this is literally like him walking into the climax of the story. So like what I mean, sure, it's it's like the last major thing that happens, but it, it never ceases to amaze me that he enters the chamber and discovers it's coral on page one. And then the last thing, the last exchange has to do with the Dursleys back in London, right? Like so it's inside like, the same chapter. He fights Voldemort and reunites with the Dursleys and re yeah, it's like it's like wait. No, sure. Surely, surely that's the same two, chapter. Yeah, surely it's two yeah, different, you like know. The, the, the number of things that happen in this chapter like Harry discovers it was Quirrell comes face to fa face to back of the face with Voldemort yep. gets the stone out of the mirror kills Quirrell wakes up in the hospital wing has the whole end of book breakdown with Dumbledore has the end of book breakdown with Ron and Hermione goes to the feast wins the gr wins the house cup and then takes a train ride home like all of that is in this chapter. Yes, yes, yeah. it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's so I mean, it's like it's jam packed. I mean, it's probably a, a case study in using words intentionally. Yeah, this is, like this is some very concise writing. Yes, exactly. Like in order to in order to fit all that in there without it feeling extraordinarily rushed, which right. again, you know, like I, I never even realized this was the case. So um, kind of impressive on that front. But anyway, so basically we get Harry's just just you know, utter amazement that the person that he's actually facing is Quirrell. And um, even like, you know, of course, you know, I'm listening and reading to to each chapter to kind of get like both both vibes a little bit. Mm -hmm. But like the the voice used for Quirrell just so, sort of like without the stutter, just like the me, he said calmly. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. It's like all of a sudden Quirrell does seem like 
a lot more formidable. Right. Like, right away. Right. You know, you're like, it's oh, like the oh. Fact, <laughs> you're like, because you're simultaneously realizing that he's been the villain the whole time and that he has been like faking the stutter. Like it yeah, has all been yeah. such an act that like everything you thought about him was a lie, which means the opposite must be true. That like, oh, if he's not cowering and like nervous, then he must actually be really dangerous. Yeah, I mean, and this is sort of like a thing that I mean, I don't know how to translate exactly to people you know out there in the real world, but I mean, it's it, it's like so weird if you thought like something that was a cornerstone of somebody who you know personally, like if you're like this was like the main thing I know about you and then to have that like dissolved, it's sort of like, wait a second, I don't know you at all. Exactly. Like everything yeah. that I thought I knew, now I have to like revisit every conversation. Now I have to mm. reimagine every like instance, every impulse, like, right. you know, like what, what does this change about everything I thought I knew? Um, so I did write a note here, though, that I wish I could relive this uh, moment again for the first time, just because uh, I do remember the absolute state of shock. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting is is just the sentiment I just said out loud, which is the I wonder whether or not I'd be meeting you here, Potter. Um, th- this is something in my head that, again, like whenever I like recall the story without thinking of the specific details in my head, it almost seems like Voldemort like intends to encounter Harry at the end. Yeah. But I, 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 it's like, that's not explicitly true. Like, I mean, on some level, it's a little bit of like a coincidence that they both happen to be in there. And it, otherwise, Quirrell just is just in the chamber that night and he's just quarter, like, you know, he's just going to fail at getting the stone. He's just going oh, to try know. again a different day. Right. Like, that's the thing. Or, or if he can even get out, you right. know, <laughs> like that's the other part of it. Like if like uh, that, so it, there's a weird thing at the end of the chapter where it seems like Harry believes that Dumbledore like intended for him to try and go down and stop Quirrell slash Voldemort. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is an interesting thought because at the same rate, it's like if if Quirrell tries to go down there and steal the stone like by himself, like he's not going to be able to get it. Like there's no need for hair. Like he'll just fail because he can't get it out of the mirror and he's like never going to be able to get it out of the mirror. So it's like and and then the fact that Harry is like uniquely capable of getting the stone out of the mirror. Like if if Dumbledore intended for Harry to go down there, but hid the stone in a mirror that he knows Harry alone is going to be able to get the stone out of. It's like you had a perfect system, but you like sort of introduced this glaring weakness well, to and, the problem. And here's the thing, because this is this is like the big question. So um, Ethan, our editor, was was chatting with us after I think last week's episode, and he was like, you guys might need to explain Dumbledore's big plan a little bit more um, like at at length basically Mm -hmm. because it's it's one of these things that we've made a huge video series about over on the super carlin brothers youtube channel we spent a lot of time talking about it we probably do speak a little bit here on the show as if people sort of like understand that concept or or what we're presenting as if this is like a known right you know like, like a known way to perceive the story so with that being said i think we can take your exact point here and and maybe like give like a crash course on the overall big plan sure because on some level i i feel like what you could make the argument for because i had the same thought as i was reading this chapter i'm like realistically harry being in the chamber beneath the school with quirrell and the mirror is worse for protecting the stone than anything else. Right. And we've always sort of made the argument that we believe that like the reason why like like what's happening is like Dumbledore is knowing each of the Golden Trio's specific strengths. So the reason that there's a chess set is on purpose because Ron can beat the chess set. The reason right. there's a logic puzzle is because Hermione can beat the logic puzzle. Because right. the reason there's a flying puzzle is because Harry, Harry is, beat is the seeker. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Even even Fluffy is sort of an obstacle that um, is brought to the table by none other than Hagrid, who has been like one of Harry's other best friends inside of the wizarding world right and on some level you know like Dumbledore sort of has this like immense trust for Hagrid and and we've kind of suggested or alluded to the idea that maybe maybe part of that trust is knowing exactly how Hagrid will behave for better or for worse right like <laughs> like Dumbledore is only ever willing to trust Hagrid with information that he is okay with slipping in the ways that he knows Hagrid could slip. So right. you're, you're definitely providing a lot of puppeteering perspective for Dumbledore and, and basically suggesting that this whole first year, you know, especially even as you fast forward to the Prince's Tale in Deathly Hallows, like there's the, the one throwaway line that I know we've brought up a million times, but it's it's Dumbledore basically advising Snape or requesting of Snape, like keep an eye on Quirrell, won't you? So it's like even that somewhat suggests that like Dumbledore knows 
that there's a reason to be watching out for one of his own teachers inside of yeah. his own school throughout the whole year. I mean, he could just sack Quirrell at right. any like, time. Dumbledore could st- like if he's so concerned about Quirrell, like yeah, he could just fire him at any point that he wants. Right. So yeah. so my my rough argument here on some level would be that I think that Dumbledore feels very in control this whole first year of all of the players. I think he kind of knows just about where everybody is on the map. Yeah. And I think that like a lot of what he's doing is like watching events unfold and attempting to learn more about not just Harry and Voldemort, but what their relationship might be like with one another. And in, in, in the grand scheme of things, like what does it mean for Harry to be the one capable of defeating the dark Lord? Because going into school, going into this year of school, even the, the, the death eaters, like part of the reason Malfoy extends a hand of friendship to Harry is because the death eaters believe that, that Harry could be the second coming of the dark Lord, right? Like that's how he was able to defeat Voldemort because he's an even darker, more powerful wizard. Exactly. So, so for Harry to be the one capable of defeating Voldemort, isn't, explicitly saying it's for the good right I mean, sure that that might just be suggesting that like this guy can beat him but you're gonna he's your bigger problem also. right yeah so to me my interpretation my suggestion that i would lob out into the ether would basically be that what we're getting here is dumbledore is attempting to understand who harry is at his core what does this person stand for? What well, that's probably why he lets him find the mirror. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I think that that's a big, big, big step. You know, he gives him the invisibility cloak. He gives it to him over Christmas. He has the mirror planted out in the middle of the school available in a classroom just right. to be entered. Yeah. You know, where's, it's like, where's the stone at that point? Right, right. I mean, it, it's like it, precisely like you know, at this point in time, Dumbledore is just like, no, it's not really a risk. Like, that's not the problem. Right. Yeah. It's like that. That's the th- that's like the grand facade of this whole book is that Dumbledore cares at all. If Voldemort gets the stone it, like the whole thing is a big like no, it, that that's really not important here. It's right. Like the this I don't ca- even if he gets it, I don't care. That's not a big deal. That's that's not what I'm testing here. It's, it's like a bit of a farce. Like it, right. it's almost like like maybe even like and again, like I said, like, you know, he knows like all the players on the map and everything. It's like maybe even Dumbledore knows it's like you're not actually going to be able to do what you think you're going to be able to do with the elixir of life. Like, right. like even if you get it, even if you get hands on it, I don't think that you're going to be able to return the way that you think you're going to be able to return. And th- I think uh, this was, this was sort of something we were chatting about with the team a little bit, but even the fact that Nicholas Flamel's like age at this moment is 665. Yeah. And, and th- like by the destruction of the zone, s- the stone itself, meaning he won't become 666 years old. Yeah. That feels like, intentional. It feels a little intentional. It, yeah. feel, it feels to me like a little bit like even like, possibly Nicholas Flamel was like 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 Dumbledore's not guarding the stone or something. It's like this is all like strategic. Maybe and you know we even talked about the centaurs. Maybe it's written in the stars. Right. You know like, well because we just made a video over on the on the main Super Carlin Brothers channel about how like the centaurs read the sky and stuff and how Dumbledore has that pocket watch with the 12 plant with like all the little yeah, 12 the hands planets, and all yeah. the planets on and it's like there's no reason to overcomplicate telling the time right like what is the point of that watch? And it's like, what if the point of that watch is just like, that's his way to like glance at the future rather than at this, you know, at the sky or something. Right. right so it's right. like, he, maybe he's able to like, you know, discern more information because he can read the planets in the same way that the centaurs can, even though most wizards can't. Right. Exactly. And, and so basically the, the, the proposal would be that a lot of what you're seeing inside of this and a lot of the reason, because I mean, we we've said it a million times, but like, why would there be obstacles guarding the stone? That's an obstacle just merely suggests that like, if you're willing to beat or if you're able to beat our challenges, then yeah, go right ahead. Go ahead and take it. It's like, it's like, it's almost as if like, yeah, if, if you can beat us, then you're entitled to the prize at the end of the journey. And it's like wrong, you know, like that's not how anybody protects anything. Right. And it's like, and the obstacles just don't matter because no one can get through the mirror anyway. Exactly. Like you may as well put it up in the great hall and say the stones in here. Like there's nothing anyone can do about it unless you're hairy. Right. So yeah. what it what it really does, and, and exactly what what you know you brought up already, and what Harry says is that um, let's see here. I'm, I want to get the exact line from Harry, but it's basically when he's telling Ron and Hermione that he thinks that Dumbledore pretty much was was 
giving them the opportunity to take a stab at it if if they so desired. But I also, yeah, so he's a funny man, Dumbledore. I think he sort of wanted to give me a chance. I think he knows more or less everything that goes on here, you know? Um, I think he had, a, I reckon he had a pretty good idea we were going to try, and instead of stopping us, he just taught us enough to help. I don't think it was an accident. He let me find out how the mirror worked. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. But the thing is, is that I just don't see a world where Dumbledore is actually, did you highlight the exact <laughs> same thing? Whole paragraph. Um, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is that I just don't think that Dumbledore would actively send a lamb in for slaughter. No. Well, like, that's the thing is that either he doesn't really think that like Voldemort getting the stone is that big a deal or having seen what Harry saw in the mirror. He's like he's confident that it doesn't matter if Harry gets the stone out while Quirrell is there with Voldemort. Like they can't beat Harry. Like he already has enough faith in him. Yes. Like I it's it's of no concern like Harry will already beat you right 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 and and so I think and then what we ultimately know as well is that like when um, Dumbledore is talking about Harry's greatness you know when when they're in limbo in King's Cross station after Harry has faced death you know in the Forbidden Forest at the hands of Voldemort he one of the first things that Dumbledore brings up is like do you know how few people could have seen what you saw in that mirror like, yeah like he is talking about Harry's just innate uniqueness he's his unique uh, nobility, which even the moment that um, Harry wakes up in the hospital wing, I feel like there's a couple of really uh, interesting tidbits there. One of which is that when Harry first wakes up, he sees something gold glinting just above him, the snitch. He tried to catch it, but his arms were too heavy. He blinked. It wasn't a snitch at all. It was a pair of glasses. How strange. I think it's so interesting to me that like Harry's effectively coming up from darkness and is, is mistaking what he's seeing, which is the kind eyes of Albus Dumbledore mm-hmm. as a snitch, when also eventually Dumbledore will give him a golden a snitch, snitch yeah. specifically so that he's able to go in reverse order and accept death. Right. Like, it's, <laughs> like, it's like the scene just plays itself out in the other direction. That is, that's very, you're right. I, I did not interpret it that way, but I do really like that, um, that reading of it. Yes, that's but then very clever. even Harry's immediate reaction upon waking up um, is that uh, he, he his immediate concern is for the stone itself. Right. And and over and over again, you know, Dumbledore is attempting to explain to him, like, you know, what what's happened. And and instead of ever being concerned about like his own health, what happened to me? What happened? You know, it's like he's like Voldemort has a stone. Voldemort has a stone. Voldemort has a stone. Right. Like, yeah. Like, I need to warn you. It's like, bad. Come on. <laughs> hold on. Listen. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, and, and so, you know, they're going back and forth and, and Dumbledore says three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley and Mrs. Granger will be most relieved to have come around. They have been extremely worried. But sir, the stone, I see you are not to be distracted. Very well, the stone. Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from you. I am wrapped in time to prevent that. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's just like even even in like and, and I mean this is this is Harry through and through. You know, like this is this is like the innate goodness, the innate bravery that this this you know soul is capable of possessing. Is that I mean he's just like he doesn't have false intentions. He's not seeking glory. He is just literally trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, and I think personally, that's the point of all of book one is Dumbledore wants to learn whether or not that's what he has with on his side. Yeah. So I don't know if we actually uh, to, to to round that off, if we're going to try and explain the premise of Dumbledore's big plan, then as it fits into the greater thing is that the idea behind Dumbledore's big plan is that from is that Dumbledore is the only one who knows the full prophecy having been the one it was made to right meaning he alone knows that Harry is like destined to possibly defeat Voldemort right and since he knows that by himself he is able to like quietly pull the strings on Harry's life and guide him towards that ultimate end and if you're like looking for it, you can see the ways in which he is directing Harry's life because he knows the prophecy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's basically sending him through, you know, like a maze of sorts, attempting to, you know, kind of like whittle him into exactly who he needs to be in order to successfully face death. Right. Yes. You know? It all, and, it all culminates there. And there's a lot of like, you know, um, there's a lot of clouds on the map too. Like at this point, like Dumbledore doesn't know about the Horcruxes or anything. That's also true. Either, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a lot of stuff that, that Dumbledore himself 
uh, hasn't been able to fully piece together, but things that that Harry will actively contribute to right. rather significantly and and absolutely starting with our next book, Chamber of Secrets. So we'll, yeah. we'll get into that as we as we get there. But in the meantime, I think we've made it about mm, four sentences into this <laughs> chapter. So <laughs> we've far. made it far. We've covered a lot though, so I don't think we have to. We don't have to necessarily uh, go just go hyper aggressively. But um, where 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 would you like to go from here? Well, I one I think it's interesting. That even I mean, not to get stuck on the fourth sentence again, but he says, I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. And it's like interesting to me that Quirrell was concerned he'd meet the first year Harry Potter and not like Snape or one of the professors or something like Quirrell's concerned about Harry. Right, right. right. Like, <laughs> like he, knew like, he yeah. hasn't actually been that meddlesome, but he does say like, no, 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 I tried to kill you. I'm like, even that I'm like, why, why were you trying to kill Harry? Like what had he done to that point? That was like, I got to get rid of that 11 year old. He is going to mess up my plans. Right. Well, like, so do you not, do you not think at this point in time that Voldemort has just been being like, Hey, that's the one that's the kid we don't that's like. The one. I mean, I guess that's probably that's <laughs> probably it. I guess um, he talks about how Hermione broke his eye contact. I'm like, that's just never how jinxes are described again for the rest of the book, the rest of the series. So oh, I, just I think know. that's interesting. There's another one of those where, where just a couple paragraphs later we get Quirrell snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry. That's like that's some pretty impressive. Yeah, some pretty wandless impressive non-verbal. And, yeah, yeah, wandless and non-verbal magic. Like, yeah, like, whoops, that's crazy. I mean, yeah. I guess, again, Voldemort maybe is teaching him some tricks and stuff. Could be. Could I be. Guess so. Yep, absolutely. Um, I love where <laughs> he says, like, why do you think Snape wanted to referee your next match? Uh, but then uh, he's wanted to make sure that I didn't try and kill you again, but he needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor from winning. He did make himself unpopular. <laughs> Which <laughs> I, love, I love that because it's like, Dumbledore lets that happen. <laughs> it's like, right. Dumbledore be like, Snape, don't worry. Like, great instincts on trying to protect Harry. I'll be there. So you don't got to worry about it. Every, like, <laughs> everything's going to be just fine. But I I will be delighted to watch you fly around and try to do this. Go ahead and get up there. <laughs> Make yourself unpopular. Right. Like, like I think there's like a foul that he presents to uh, the other team, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe Snape is just out of his depth. He's like, yeah. it's it's not that he's even picking on Gryffindor. He's just like, he just doesn't you, know how what are the works? rules again? <laughs> That'd be so funny. Oh man, that's uh, I like that. That's good. If he just doesn't know how to how to do it at all. Yep, um, yep, yep. Especially when you just consider the fact that I mean, like Quidditch seems to be the thing that, or one of the things that Snape d- despises so much about James's whole like character as a as a Hogwarts student, which yeah. which almost certainly suggests that Snape was not on the Slytherin squad. There's no way Snape played Quidditch at all. Yeah, w- no. without it coming up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it seems like eventually ba- Battle of the Seven Potters. He must be a pretty OK flyer. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see it being something that motivates him highly um, to be like, well, if, if that's the kind of thing that Lily likes, I got to I got to be good at brooms. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, otherwise, I did. I did have a little <coughs> note here as this exchange is going on. It's just the it reminds me so much of uh, the Incredibles where he's like he starts monologue. Oh my gosh. I know I even wrote down. It's just like he's needlessly open. I know. Yeah, he's just, he's just like I got to tell you everything about how this year unfolded and, and why all of it is p- did, did exactly what it did. So I did write a, a note down as well as um, whether or not uh, some of some of the monologue is like for the benefit of the reader. Oh, I mean, a thousand percent it is right. So, I mean, a, a lot of like what what's happening here is it's it's basically um, like th- this thing that happened. Let, let me try to explain to you why why like th- that happened so that you don't end up always just asking the question uh, like what, what am I trying to say here? So you're not always just asking the question like, well, why didn't this just happen? Why didn't this just happen? It's like, well, I got to now I got to explain. Oh, I mean, yes, this is, this is just like an exposition trick yes. that happens. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah, here's all the twists revealed. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's really what happens. It does. There's a funny thing. Where it's like he had to keep Coral from giving his whole attention to the mirror. I love like Harry's determination to like stop him from doing it. And it's like you really don't like he's there's nothing he can do. He can't get it out. Not that Harry knows that the mirror works right there. Um, but yeah, he did like where I was just like, yeah, Voldemort, he's with me wherever I go. It's like you don't need to tell him that 
You don't yeah. have to tell him. That. <laughs> yeah. Like you don't have to talk to him at all. Come I literally on, wrote down surprisingly <laughs> candid. Yeah, <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> candid. Okay, I think this is funny. Um, he says he does not. Or when he's talking about Voldemort, he said does not forgive mistakes easily. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was most displeased. Which I find pretty funny because you'd have think you'd have thought that on some level Voldemort must have been a little bit validated by Gringotts' defenses in keeping uh, Quirrell out because at this moment Voldemort is already hiding one of his Horcruxes at Gringotts. You know? Oh, that's true. Yeah, right? yeah. The, so the like Hufflepuff's cup, right? Like yeah. had Quirrell successfully stolen the stone, he'd have to have been like Bellatrix. Like we got to move because it turns out pretty easy to steal <laughs> stuff. Even <laughs> Quirrell got it. <laughs> Quirrell figured I it out. I wasn't even okay. with him then. He just did it. He did, I know. I know. Which that's that is one of those things that um, they, they actually do include the line specifically. That was uh, uh, how could he have been so stupid? He how could he have been so stupid? He'd seen Quirrell there that very day, shaking hands with him at the Leaky Cauldron. Um, th- this is like I think one of those things where a lot of people have posed the question before in the past, like why doesn't Quirrell melt when they shake hands at the Leaky Cauldron? Right. So th- this is definitely clarifying that exact thing. So I think we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that Voldemort is not occupying. Quirrell's body when they meet at the Leaky Cauldron. No, and so. then because he fails to steal the stone, that is the catalyst for him occupying his body. Like yes. you are, you stink, man. I got, I got to keep closer eyes on you. Can't be relying on 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 your instincts. Can't even rob a bank. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, the next thing though is is whether or not um, it, it almost certainly seems like Voldemort is using Legilimens on Harry, yeah, you know, in order to uh, sort of figure out how to get the rest of this to unfold. So he almost seems to be realizing that there's a chance that Harry knows more about the mirror than Quirrell does. And like, so he, he then starts whispering, use the boy, use the boy. Those are his first words, right? Are, are those, they? Are those his first words in the book, in the story, or use the boy? Wow, yeah, that's pretty interesting, right? That is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. I always remember this is this is really funny and just a total aside anecdote. But I remember in uh, a very 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 early J versus Ben, which is our Harry Potter trivia show. Yeah, um, there was a day where it was like one of the first words that Voldemort mutters after his resurrection in uh, the graveyard <laughs> oh, yeah. of Little Hangleton. And the first thing he says upon physical form is robe me. <laughs> yeah, give me some clothes. <laughs> and I'm always like, is he just standing there in his nudie pants? <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. How I mean, embarrassing. I know. Jeez. Um, let's see. But yeah, use the boy. So they get Harry in front of the mirror. Um, Harry just immediately and successfully lies to Quirrell, who doesn't second guess him at all. Right, right, yeah. right. Yep, yep. Yeah, I thought uh, I was like, uh, I, I think Quirrell does not press hard enough at all right there. And then we already sort of talked about it. So it feels like sort of bad design by Dumbledore if he intends for Harry to interfere, but Harry is also the only one who can get the stone out. Like, boy, if Harry just hadn't gone down there, then what happens? Then they're just stuck. Then, they're, yeah, exactly. And and that's that's the other big curiosity as well. Is a couple of things. One is that like if if Harry doesn't go down here, then is there a way for Quirrell to escape? Uh, the other question is is that we know that the battle is about to go down, and that in in doing so, um, Dumbledore is able to successfully get through to the the dungeon. Yeah. And so part of my question is like there's a there's a secret trap door that's being guarded by Fluffy. Is there an even secreter trap door right. that Dumbledore like pops in through the roof and just like falls through the rafters and it's like what up? <laughs> yeah, like did Dumbledore have to like play through the chess set and stuff? I know, yeah, you that's know? that's the question because right. I mean you have to imagine at that point in time that like like he must have been literally on their heels or even just like like watching them pass through it themselves waiting for his turn. Oh, I know. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, if he gets there with enough time, with just enough time to pull Harry off, it seems like like whilst they're in the potion room, he's like right behind them playing chess. Yes. You know, like he has to be that close or like it wouldn't. I mean, getting past Fluffy and the Devil's Snare would both take almost zero time at all. If you know they're there and Dumbledore knows they're all there. He I can even see Dumbledore just being able to like summon the appropriate key out of the air. Sure. Like without like, I just think he's probably magical enough to do it. Although right. uh, that he doesn't have to like fly around forever catching it. <laughs> I know, which would seem so silly. Like, yeah, you know. But I mean, it is one of those things where it would be kind of interesting, you know, like you know, in a long form, uh, like film or TV show format, to almost like be cutting in between 
Dumbledore having to like endure all of these right. all of these tasks. And so you're sort of like, is he gonna make it? Is he gonna make it? Is he gonna make it? Because that would be really fun for anybody who had never seen or read this story before. Yeah. It'd be like kind of like an interesting way. It's like, well, Harry's about to face this doom right now. Like, like, come on, he has Dumbledore. no way out. And you haven't even caught the key yet? Oh yeah. my gosh. Jeez. I know. I know. Then the chest set, I could just see it being like, hurry up. Like, I know, yeah. Because like, presumably he's not just going to like four move checkmate. No, but they're playing black anyway. So it's like you have your work cut out for you playing against this chess set. You know, it's not going to be a short game. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I that. mean, then the potion, obviously the troll's already down to the potion. He knows exactly what the right answer is. So just pick it up and go. Yeah. But like, yeah, the, the fire in the potion room should stop Quirrell from getting out. It should. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't have any other way to, to get out. Right. Yeah. We start to get like the, the real battle unfolding between... Voldemort, who is now just facing Harry full on. Uh, and I, I thought there was like one piece of dialogue in particular that kind of stood out to me that I hadn't caught before. Um, but uh, Voldemort to Harry says, don't be a fool. Better save your own life and join me or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Liar, Harry shouted, shouted suddenly. Um, and then Voldemort responds with, how touching. I always value bravery. And this is kind of an interesting one. Um, and goes back to like one of our, our other... Uh, kind of big theories, which is what, because um, th- that's obviously like a very Gryffindor trait. Yeah, you know, valuing bravery, and I mean, he could just be being sarcastic or, or, or evil yeah. or whatever. Um, but it is, it is kind of fascinating because we know as much as Voldemort is a Slytherin and buys into these sort of like very fanatical, radical, pure-blooded beliefs that supposedly come from Salazar Slytherin yeah. himself. We we know that. He was still willing to use Hufflepuff's cup, Ravenclaw's diadem, you know, and then yeah. and then was looking for something from Gryffindor right. in order to make his final Horcrux. So th- this is kind of one of those things where it's like, like, w- it's kind of hard to like wrap your head around, or or it was for me at least, is that in my head, I would imagine that Tom Riddle hates Gryffindor. Like he would hate everything to do with Gryffindor, but he doesn't really like he he has a fascination with the founders of Hogwarts. Well, because he lo- I mean because he loves Hogwarts. He, because he loves Hogwarts. Yeah, exactly. He like and and so like when it comes down to it, this basically what I'm suggesting is I feel like that line in particular. I was like I feel like it's another feather in the cap for the idea that he did in fact when he was going to kill Harry in Godric's Hollow, he had the sword of Gryffindor. Oh with yeah, him one as, of my favorite theories, absolutely, is that he had the sword with him when he went to go kill Harry and was intending for that to be his last Horcrux. Yes. Um, I also thought what's interesting about that passage is that when he says better save your own life and join me like this is like it's not really something that like that offer for Harry to join Voldemort never really comes up again. Oh yeah. You sure. know like yeah. it, it feels like maybe that could have been like a plot line like um, very you know Luke and the Emperor kind of thing where it's like, oh, yeah, don't worry about beating him. We'll just get him to our side. Right. But it's like and there's even, I think, a, a moment earlier in this book where Harry is like, I'm never going to the dark side or something. So I I'm almost surprised there's not like a section of the book where you're like wondering if Harry's like going down the wrong path. He's getting a little darker. I know. But like, yeah, it's like he says he's never going to do it. He refuses him here and Voldemort's like, all right, good enough for me. This kid's solid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like hey, iron clad. Iron clad. <laughs> He is surely in extreme opposition to me. Yeah. Um, But it is also kind of interesting that he would even extend that offer of joining him because at this point in time, at least Voldemort himself knows enough of the prophecy to know that neither can live while the other survives. Right. So it's like it's like you would never benefit from having even Harry on your side, even if he was willing to do it. Oh, like, well, I mean, even even the offer, I feel like is a lie. Yeah, like it's yeah. just he just wants Harry to join him to get the stone. And then I think he'd kill him no matter what. Almost he doesn't certainly. genuinely want an ally. Right. But um, you're, yeah, it's like he never he never goes for this tact ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Th- this was a weird question. And I literally I mean, this is this is like half baked at best. But it was I, when I was wondering about like if he got the stone, and he was going to use it. Like I sort of imagine, like like Quirrell either like touching the stone to like the this like um, vaporeal, you know, mist that he's existing at. I was like, would that then like transmute the mist into like a physical body? And if so, would it be gold? 
Oh, <laughs> I think it turns metal into gold. I, I mean, it does turn metal into gold. I, that's yeah. a good. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So, so the mist surely isn't metal. So probably not that. But I was like, it would be so interesting if if somehow we had like a really tanned. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, like 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 just you know bronze or something. Right. Because he's always described as so like pale or almost like semi translucent. Yeah. You know, if he um, was just like shining, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if like it's all like, the iron in his blood was now gold, yeah. right, 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 right. That would be super interesting. But yeah, that's it's always been kind of one of those things where I was like, what would he do? I know it says it produces the elixir of life, and I'm like, what does that mean? Like, is there like liquid pouring out of the stone? Do you like touch it to water and it turns it into the elixir of life? Do you just do? You, yeah, would you just touch Voldemort with the stone and he would get his body back? Right, like it almost feels yeah. more like an ingredient, but I could almost see a world where it is such a complex ingredient ingredient that what you're adding it to is something as simple as like water you know right. like it's just like water and 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 philosopher's stone gives you the elixir of life right and that is how you can sustain life but the other thing we know at least from the fantastic beast movies is that um at this point in time nicholas flamel is not in good health like or at the very least he's quite frail yeah you know from this extraordinarily long existence so it's it's that's the other thing that i've always found kind of fascinating is that like it doesn't really feel like the stone would give him strength and power and body and form in the same way that what we ultimately ultimately see uh, unfold in and you know again in little Hangleton mm -hmm. where where he does you know like achieve his body like what he ultimately ends up doing almost seems better than what he's attempting to do right here well I think this is just to get his body back I think vault Dumbledore ultimately says that is like the the stone would have been able to give him his body back but after that he would have continued to rely on his horcruxes oh, okay okay yeah okay I got you yeah that's interesting. So I think this is just get back to a corporeal form kind of a kind of a husk yeah, yeah <laughs> right. okay okay all right well that makes sense um but then from there, we, we sort of get like, you know, the uh, the, the very classic. And, and this was like one of those things, again, as a kid, as I was listening to it, I was like, I don't know how Harry wins, you know, like, I mean, I was like, I because Quirrell refuses to use his wand. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> like, um, I literally wrote that. He says, Master, I cannot hold him. It's like, I literally wrote, dude, use your wand, <laughs> which hilariously is the exact opposite problem Voldemort himself has when he's going to attack baby Harry. It's right. Like he probably could have been successful using any other method other than Avada Kedavra slash magic. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, I mean, I don't know. So it, it's, kind I of don't funny. know. Do you think he would have been? Do you, I mean, in my mind, I feel like what he is, what Harry is most protected by is by magic. And this is another one of those like Voldemort could not be Voldemort if he was capable of loving. Like if, if Voldemort was capable of using a non magical method of attacking Harry, then, I, then I it could work. I think because he kills Lily with the Vada Kedavra, it's like Lily, Lily's spell is protecting Harry like specifically from Voldemort, I think. Yeah. Right. What, so what, what do you think I'm saying? So I, th I think if he had like stabbed Lily, if he'd managed to kill her without magic. Oh, or oh, something. Stabbed. Nice. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, wh whatever the case. I think I think if he had Vada Kedavra, if everything else is the same, but then he pulls out a knife and tries to like stab Harry, then like that knife still doesn't work. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so you think you think he is protected from Voldemort basically no matter what? Yeah. Like, like it would just like ping off him. I think so. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's an interesting one. I feel like that's a that's like some 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 room for conversation. There, it least. does seem like that could be. Uh, unlike the other hand, like if it, there had been like someone else in the room and they had just done the spell, like yeah, then Harry's doomed. Right, right, and right. This is this is constantly his problem. Like just let someone else do it, man. I know, I know. But yeah. that, I mean, so that's the other question as well, though, is that if the prophecy is at work and, and if you subscribe to the prophecy at all, then was Harry safe of all other physical maladies? forever and for always so like like when he falls off his broomstick in prisoner you know and falls like hundreds of feet yeah. you know, Dumbledore catches him at the last second but Dumbledore was always going to catch him somebody was always going to catch him at the last second because he was never going to die that way I don't yeah I don't think so I think he could have died from okay. other means it's okay. not like the prophecy is like you know glowing bright blue every time Harry nears death and it's like well make something happen <laughs> it's like we need to interject <laughs> whoa yeah. yeah yeah that's okay okay that's a, that's a big question and how much is like the path laid out before you kind of thing yeah you know yeah, I think it's just that Voldemort puts so much stock by the prophecy that like he believes in it so much that no matter what, he is going to continue to hunt Harry, which guarantees that one of them will kill the other. Okay, because if even if Harry is like, I don't I don't believe in the prophecy, like it doesn't matter because Voldemort does. So he will always try and kill Harry. So right. Harry so he, will always have to defend himself. Yes. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or just let him win. Yeah. 
or just let him win, which is what he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, to Voldemort's dismay. To Voldemort's dismay. <laughs> there we go. Um, but so then this is the other big question is that um, there's always a little bit of like a dark thing, especially the film, because uh, Harry does ultimately end up defending himself using his hands, which ultimately melts Quirrell into like a form of ash or something. It's absolutely in self-defense no matter what. Um, but this is one of those where um, it almost seems like the way that it's phrased possibly could be sparing um, Harry from having been the one who who does actually kill him. Like I think Dumbledore says like I arrived just in time, um, you know, to to pull Quirrell off of you. Yeah, which we know that Quirrell ends up not surviving the exchange because he's not anywhere else, but it also might mean that Harry was not the one to like snuff him out. So right. Speak. Yeah. You know, so it's like, I don't think yeah, it's like I don't think Harry gets credit for having killed Quirrell. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't really know what ultimately does take him or if he's just so weakened by the exchange that he just. Yeah. What does it say? I feel like maybe it's something to do with like Voldemort exiting his body is what maybe kills him like like he can't touch Harry without enduring the pain. But then like when Vol because like I think that's why Quirrell has to drink the unicorn blood because like as long he, Voldemort's basically like a big parasite on him and right. he's like, like he's actively weakening. He's actually yeah. sort of weakening him and then like when he's like all right see ya like then that's it right yeah. right and and I think that even when when you delve into um, like when he's talking about his return again in, in Gobble to Fire I think he says that he was able to like occupy like snakes and rats um, but like his presence was was too much for most of them as well. So I suppose it stands to reason that like a human in the form of coral could handle it for longer than a snake or a rat could. Yeah. But but eventually it was still going to be still going to get there. too much. So I, I think you could easily make the argument that Voldemort is the one as a parasite that kills. Yeah, because there's just something where like Dumbledore shows just as little concern for his like allies as he does his enemies. Where is that line in this chapter? I feel like I just read it. He left Quirrell to die. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. He shows just as little mercy to his followers as his enemies. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So. So there's that. I, th I think Voldemort leaving Quirrell is what kills Quirrell. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we can spare Harry right. of, of <laughs> collecting his first kill at age, exactly. age 11. <laughs> well, because the thing is, like, we know Harry doesn't have a split soul, so I don't think. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, yes. it, that, that's sort of like one of those, like, is it in doing it in self-defense? Does that matter? Like, would that still split your soul if you killed someone in self-defense? I mean, yeah, that's like that's some whole other. Feels yeah, like, that feels like another layers of magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a completely different moral debate. But I mean, it, it seems um, to me as though it would be d different. Yeah, it, it feels it feels that way. Yeah, this is like this premeditated type. Ooh, type oh, of. I just thought of something. Okay. Is that like interestingly, Harry passes out, so he doesn't actually witness Coral die either, which means the Thestrals remain invisible to him as well. So, what, I mean, this is always the question as well when it comes to that: is um, d does he witness his mother's death? Oh, right. Yeah, that's another weird one, right? Because because it's like clear. It's like uh, he seems like he was awake and he has memories of it, yes. and he continues to remember more and more of it. <laughs> Right, right. So that's that's more of like a question of does is he actively remembering or like was the magical reverberations kind of similar to that of like a like a like a vinyl record being able to, you know, uh, store music through like vibrations. Right. It's, it's almost like is is he more like imprinted on of the event based on based on all of the intensity that existed in the room. Right. So it's like he can hear these like echoes of what happened, even if he doesn't have like an actual memory yeah. of it. Right. Because he like remembers the green light and he can hear the screaming and he can even hear like the dialogue at some point after the Dementors get closer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but like Lily pleading for his yeah. life. It clearly yeah. never ends up counting for the Thestrals. It's not until so, Cedric. Not until Cedric. And even then, it apparently takes time to process because Cedric dies and then they like leave for the summer and he can't see the Thestrals when they go down to the train yeah, at the end right. of four, which yeah. honestly feels like more of a mistake. If you ask me, it, than does, it, do, it does feel a little bit like that. <laughs> like, mm, this is supposed to be a book five thing. So yeah, we're just talking about that. I, I, I can't, he hasn't processed Cedric's death yet. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. Uh, I do think we have an entire video about that somewhere where I feel like we, we found some nugget or some morsel that was like, see now 
now is when it's happened. Mm-hmm. You know, like this, this is the moment where he's like this fully. Okay. I think I want to say there's even like maybe like Harry's eyes are like described as being closed when Cedric dies. So like maybe he didn't see him die or something, which would be even worse. But yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, th- but then but, but then yeah, we're but then how can he see him? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're getting way too far ahead. Yeah, way too far. <laughs> talking about festivals at the end of book one. Um, <laughs> okay, so what what else do we have here in this chapter to close out? Because we've we've made it out of the chamber. We get back to yeah, the right. conversation uh, with with Dumbledore, who is now kind of like willing to provide. Um, the lightest bit of context. <laughs> yeah, just just like a little bit. So it's kind of interesting because he like Dumbledore is in a very strange position because Harry has now quite literally put his life on the line. Like Harry's got, you know, like skin in the game, yeah. so to speak. And it, from Dumbledore's perspective, he's faced with his own ethical quandary a little bit, which is like, to what extent do you provide or allow Harry to have some semblance of a childhood. Yeah. Some semblance of, of what life was supposed to be like. The thing that largely has been robbed from him for most of his life under, you know, like the roof of the Dursleys, yeah. uh, through his family being like ripped apart just as a baby. So it's like, you know, Dumbledore is, he, he says here that like, I won't, I, I can't tell you everything, but I also promise not to lie to you. Um, he says, let's see here. Um, the truth, Dumbledore sighed. It was a beautiful and terrible thing and should therefore be treated with great caution, which I think is a really, really spectacular sentence. Um, however, I shall answer your questions unless I have a very good reason not to, in which case I beg you'll forgive me. I shall not, of course, lie. Um, and as as you start to like read some of these exchanges, so then, of course, Harry basically asks right away, like, you know... Um, like what why did Voldemort like this is this is like the biggest question that we all are asking in the whole series <clears throat> why did Voldemort want to kill him as a baby right you know so at this point in time nobody's mentioned the prophecy you know, yeah breath of word of the prophecy yeah, yeah. Well, that's the answer to that one yes yeah <coughs> so he, he can't says that and of course he says alas the first thing you asked me I cannot tell you not today you will know one day um, and this is you know that's a little bit of the the sparing of of you know like the burden that Harry has placed upon him um, and, and I do think that this would be something that would be very, very, very difficult, you know, as somebody who knows more about a child situation than the child themselves or, yeah. or whether or not to tell them. I think it would even be difficult for me if my own daughter Addison asked me questions that were uh, before her time and I would be struggling like I will eventually explain this to you. But yeah. today is not the day. Right. Like, like I think it would be hard for me to say that. Like, I, I know. Think if, yeah. she, if she thought ask the question, there's going to be a compulsion in me to tell her the answer. I don't like, know. I'll just tell you the truth. You yeah. know, if you were curious enough, then then I'm then then. Yeah. If you if you were smart enough to think of the question, <laughs> then, then you must be ready for the answer. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, but so then, so then we move forward though, and we learn a little bit, um, you know, about uh, the relationship between you know Professor Snape and James Potter, where it's kind of. It, it, this is like one of those things where he, he just said he wouldn't lie. And what Dumbledore responds with uh, is, well, they did detest each other, not unlike yourself and Mr. Malfoy. And then your father did something Snape could never forgive. What? He saved his life. Yeah, this really isn't the reason. It's not really the not reason. Not really the reason. It's, it's like, I mean, it's like, because what we essentially get from this this playing out, it suggests that James has a far more important bit of history left to be explained, which I don't think is wholly true. Yeah. Like, he, of course, is a member of the Marauders. He helped create the Marauder map. He was able to become a uh, uh, an Yeah. Vegas. Um, you know, all of those types of, of details, and they figured out the Whomping Willow, which I think is what James Potter ultimately does save him from. But, like, that... No, he is, saves him from Remus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who's a werewolf? Who's a werewolf? Yeah, who's like? Yeah. Who's? Who's what he's going to find if he if Snape goes through the Whomping Willow? And I think it's Sirius who has told Snape that like, oh yeah, here's how you get through the Whomping Willow. You can find something crazy under there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and then yeah, James right. is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not yeah, go. Wait, wait, let's wait, wait, not wait. hold. Pump the brakes here, friend. But this 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 does not end up being relevant to the overall story. It's not relevant to the overall themes, the overall plots, to anything. It's yeah. Like, it's it, not relevant. It is kind of a lie. The real reason he's saving it was because he loved Lily 
And uh, yeah, that that's yep. the reason. Yep. There's also the, his explanation for like Lily's death. It says your mother died to say you saved you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. No, not a scar, no visible sign to have been loved so deeply, even through um, even though the person who loved us is gone will give us some protection forever. Like I don't love like it skates around the answer to how the sacrificial love charm works, but like the, I feel like the way he presents it, it just makes it sound like as long as anyone's mom loves them enough, Voldemort won't be able to hurt them yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, well, ah, it makes it just sound like no other mom would have died for their kid. And right. it's just like that is just patently false. And it's like you have missed. You've missed the crucial information. Again, it's about Snape being in love with Lily, but that that it is because he offered to let her live and she chooses to die like that that is the crucial bit of difference here. Yeah, sacrificial protection it's it's like it does seem like it needs to come with and and sometimes this happens in the story anyway, but it comes with a whole bunch of caveats where it's sort of like we well, have to have very special circumstances and this has to happen and that needs to be in play and you know blah 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 and it's like otherwise, you know, cuz it does seem like this was one of my biggest questions for the longest time about the whole saga was it was sort of like it just doesn't seem like Lily would have been the first person to have ever yeah, you know, like jumped in front of their child. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and maybe, maybe that's also just still true. It's just the fate of, you know, uh, like all of Wizard Kind wasn't hinging on that particular behavior and on those occasions. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, so like maybe other people have been protected from attacks from other people, but they were just maybe less overall relevant to history. <laughs> right. Like it didn't knock down the Dark Lord, or it's like and the other thing is, well, who's to say? I mean, it doesn't have to be over like a baby either. That's also true. Or, or a family yeah. member. Because Harry is able to enact the exact same kind of protection over all of the... Um, yeah, the you know. defenders of Hogwarts. Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point as well. Um, but anyway, so as we as we then trudge forward, we, we basically have like another one of these like nice little exchanges that I think kind of comes back to the core of who like Dumbledore at is you know, um, with, with the, with the birdie bots, every flavored beans. And he yeah. basically is like, Alas. you know, they're, they're just having like essentially like one of the most pivotal and important conversations for all of the, the humanity of these people. And then it's like, let's talk about jelly beans. Yeah. You know? Right. And then he, he we get the, the all too famous alas earwax. Yes. Yes. There's um, that. I also like the line here where he reveals that he's the one who gave him the invisibility cloak and he says it was your father's and your father used it mainly for sneaking off to the kitchens to steal food when he was here. It's like what I love about that sentence is that it implies that whilst James was sneaking off to the kitchens like Dumbledore just like openly knows about it and does not care. <laughs> right. He's just like yeah like because uh, we've talked about this before that like Dumbledore like is just so okay with the students like sort of testing the rules. Yeah, like, he almost like encourages it like, a little like, light, real like light, real even when here. Filch is like Mr. Filch reminds me to tell you that all of the secret passages located here 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 and here are off limits. Definitely don't go there. Wink. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> it might be good for you. A little little light rule, rule breaking. Never hurt anybody. Right. Um, he does not however know about their um, in a mega he though, does not doesn't. know about yeah. that. You're right. That so is sneaky. That's kind of an interesting one because that somehow, some way, I wonder if that makes Animagus magic more powerful than we're even giving it credit for, which is already quite a bit. But it makes me wonder if it's like undetectable in a way that is uh, kind of like unique. Yeah. If that makes sense. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, because it, if he knows about like the invisibility cloak, it feels like he would certainly know that like all of these are these guys are running around in the middle of the night, especially when he specifically sets up the Whomping Willow and the Shrieking Shack for, for the, Remus for the same reason why <coughs> the rest of them are Animagus. Yeah, right. So, yeah, but, but like, yeah, him not knowing is a crucial bit of information because then he would know how serious is getting in and out of the castle. Also true. Right. So like he definitely does not know. Yeah. Um, also, there's a that Harry asked the question. How did I get the stone out of the mirror? Which I love the answer to. Um, but my question is always, how did he get the stone in the mirror? <laughs> you know, I know yeah. <laughs> which I, I want to say there was a stab at answering in the Fantastic Beast Secrets of Dumbledore movie where him and Dumbledore and Credence have this like fight inside of like a mirror verse sort of thing. And it's like, oh, Dumbledore did a thing with a mirror again. And he like uses the deluminator to like go upside down 
or something, but we don't really ever get much of an answer for that. Yeah, I know. And and we've we've talked a lot before about how Dumbledore has a particular fascination with the Resurrection Stone because he, of course, wants to be able to bring back his family. Um, you know, part of like what he sees inside of the Mirror of Erised, almost certainly. I mean, we know what in younger years he sees Grindelwald, who he loved, but then I think later in life he would have seen again his family yeah. happy and whole is is pretty much the argument. Um, and then the Deluminator has sort of like the unique ability that we see with Ron, which is effectively that um, it can allow you to return to people you love if they say your name. Yeah. And and supposedly the Deluminator is a an, an invention of Dumbledore's own, uh, which may suggest that what he was attempting to create was the ability to travel from wherever he was to the place of his loved ones, which in his particular case is going to be beyond the grave and right. therefore they are then unable to ever speak his name so it, it's a it's like Dumbledore may not even be sure whether or not the Deluminator works the way that he thinks it does because he's never been able to successfully use it um, all of this to say though is that part of the reason because we also know again thanks to Fantastic Beasts that, that Dumbledore has had the mirror himself for, for yeah you know quite for a some long time. time yeah over 50 years um so I, I think that there's a, a very, very, very reasonable possibility that Dumbledore is probably on scale with the talents and abilities of at least the second Peveril brother who supposedly invented the Resurrection Stone. Yeah. Um, and probably with that same level of ability, probably in, in study over these devices or the stone, the mirror, the deluminator. Yeah. All of which, in, in my opinion, kind of are attempting to achieve similar outcomes yeah. that that maybe he's able to unlock certain potentials or abilities of the mirror that I would argue no one else was capable of. Yeah, I think you're right. So that yep. that's how I would piece all of that together. That's okay. My, that's my answer to that question. Great. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, Harry, or Hermione and Ron come in and get the whole breakdown um, from Harry as well. Um, Ron, this is just a fun little thing. Uh, Ron reveals that uh, Gryffindor was steamrolled by Ravenclaw without you, which I think means Cho won a game. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Right. I know. Yeah, I wondered about this as well. Was she playing as a? Was she year? as a secret yet? I don't yeah, know. Um, because she's just one year ahead. The other thing I thought was ridiculous about this. I guess that, that'd make her a second year, right? It would yeah. make her a second year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's possible. Possible. Um, yeah, almost the youngest yeah. <laughs> Quidditch player in a century. That'd be so funny. I mean, Draco's right there in year two as well. Also true. But yeah. he buys his way on the team. So yeah, but he's still there. there. But he's it still would still there. count for the for the record books. It would still count. History's not going to have that asterisk next to it. Probably not. <laughs> probably not. Um. The thing that I find ridiculous about this is that it means that they've already taken their final exams, which means they haven't played the final Quidditch match yet, which just seems unlikely. Yeah, right. Like, you know, it's just like, really? You mean to tell me that they, they play the last game of the season in like the last three days of the year? Yeah, right. Um, which I suppose is possible, but I want to fact check it with every other book and see if this also holds. holds yeah, right. True. How much time is left after they win they win the Quidditch World Cup and uh, not the Quidditch World Cup, the, the House Cup? Yeah. Yeah. After they win the Quidditch Cup yeah. before the end of the year. Yeah, I was mixing yeah. all my words there. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. no, got, you're right. We're we going to keep an know. eye on that because you're right. It's weird that it happens in the last week of the year after classes have ended. Yes, yes. Also, speaking of classes of ending, there's like this uh, thing where they, they get the grades back, which you never hear about. Um, yeah. Uh, and th they've all made it to second year. Even what? Goyle? <laughs> Even Goyle. <laughs> Even Goyle, which just to me is just like, all right, all right, all right, all right, guys, guys. How how much are we overemphasizing the end of year exams? Because like the, if Goyle's passing, they just can't be that hard. They just can't be. Yeah, no, yeah. not not even not even <clears throat> a little bit. I also I, the thing I thought was particularly particularly interesting about that exchange is just simply that um, they they talk about Goyle and not Crab. Yeah, and it's like they're always Crab and Goyle are always like always a pair, like a pair. Yeah, yeah. and it's like it's like so that must mean that Crab is a little bit smarter, a than little Goyle. bit smarter, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of edged them out. We also get an early nod to Neville's uh, good herbology mark, which I think is yep. kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm, you know, because mm -hmm. that ends up kind of continuing pretty much throughout the entire series. So it's nice that it's established. Um, so early we also get all the allocation of the house points which ultimately wins Gryffindor the house cup the house cup the house cup yeah um, but not the Quidditch cup 
not the Quidditch Cup, not the Quidditch Cup, um, where Hermione and Ron both receive 50 points each. Harry receives 60 points. And then Neville, um, it says, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I actually like the movie quote a little better there where he says, but a great deal more to stand up to your friends. Which I I, I agree with. I agree with wholeheartedly. Standing up to your friends is tough because this is like one of those things where it's like if if there are people out there in the world who vehemently disagree with your point of view or you know hold like a just like a, a subpar stance on something i'm not worried about those people being upset with right me. i'm upset I, I i worry about the people who i care for the people i want to look out for the people you know that i love those are the people i don't want to let down yeah you know and so that's that's what it feels like you're doing you know by standing up to your friends is, yeah is like that fear of like you know potentially risking the friendships, you know, in right. exchange for doing what, you know, what, what you think is right inside of that moment. So clearly it pays um, off for yes. Neville. My only thing about the house cup here and I will, this, this is that like that, like I'm so happy Harry wins and they definitely deserved it and whatever, but like I, it comes at like such a like as such a, it is delivered as such like a blow to Slytherin yeah. at the same time. And it's like, and you know, Draco is being a little jerk throughout this whole book, but he's the only Slytherin you know to be like a total like, like uh, to be a jerk. Right. Like the rest of them are maybe like a little mean spirited, but like they're not at the top of the house cup for no reason. You exactly. Know? Like, like they, they did still like, outcompete the uh, other two. Exa- by, by like a, Ray a, Bac- yeah. a significant margin. Yeah, it's not even close. Yeah. Like I do feel a little bad for the Slytherins because it's like they didn't do anything wrong in this book. Right. You know, other yeah. than what you know about Draco, but like they even with Draco, like he loses points and stuff at, at, at certain points and it's like they're still winning by a wide margin. So I'm always like a little like it's a little like I feel like the book is a little rude to slither in here because that, they definitely earned it. I, I know this <coughs> is this is I always think this is kind of funny because it's like when I was a kid, you know, I mean, just a tangent outside of the, the wizarding world for just one quick second. I remember like we were big fans of the Virginia Tech Hokies. Yeah. And so in my <coughs> mind, like as a small child, th- like the their main rivals, the University of Virginia Cavaliers. Yeah, it was like I always saw them as as like not only like our opposition, you know, our rivals, our foes or whatever, but probably like unethical people. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, like, yeah. like who are doing terrible, terrible things in the right. world, which <laughs> deserve like, all the bad things that happen to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but don't. Obviously <clears throat> don't. You know, it's like one of those things as I got older and I was a college student myself and I was like, oh, these are all just hardworking individuals who are out there who are excited right. to have excelled at their sport right. and are, you know, like they're not mean people. They're just, they're just the opposition. That's right. all it is. Like, so there was like cheating their way to the top of the house cup. The teachers are the ones giving out the points. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit dicey and you do feel a little bit bad for, for Slither and kind of getting overtaken there. The thing I do always kind of credit back to the Gryffindors though, who are currently in fourth place is that they did lose 150 points for helping out Hagrid. Yeah. So, you know, it feels like maybe, maybe a couple points for like you know helping out an old friend you know yeah could sure have, could have counted towards <laughs> towards something but you know they're they're basically recovering um most of that most yeah. of that and then an extra 30 points on top right so, or is that is that 20 math, right? points, 20 on, points top, on top yeah. yeah so um nothing nothing so basically they're winning 20 points they're for, winning 20 for, points for beating yeah. Voldemort. yeah I mean, <laughs> like, yeah you know and when you put it like that it seems like maybe not enough <laughs> maybe not enough it's like it's like to ron weasley 200 points or yeah. 200 points that is what happens at the end of next year <laughs> That's Harry true. and Rob both get like 200 points each. I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dumbledore is just like, whatever. Gryffindor wins. Right, Who right. cares? Just back of the napkin math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can figure this out. No yeah. big deal. Um, yeah, this one. He's like, let me make it really close. Let me make it. Let me just be like, wow, they just barely edged him out. Okay. Wow. What a close one. The next year he's like, Who? I don't want to do the math. Okay. What? Okay. 400 points done. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Surely that's enough. Surely that's enough. Yeah. I don't have to. I don't need to. I don't need to even fact check it. We'll be fine. Um, um, so anyway, that that basically though does bring us to the end of book one. Yes, it does. Stone. How exciting! What a fun first uh, first book for the you know end of book. It's like our first big milestone for the podcast. I know, I know. There, there's the huge part of me that wonders because I I as a listener, uh, you know, of podcasts myself, I feel like there's a decent possibility that I would have been hesitant to start until there was an end, so yeah. that I could. So that I knew <coughs> so I could, you could like, go through a full I could, season. I could go the whole season. Well, now you can. 
I know. So now you can. Now, now, in fact, we, we have made it through one whole book. Hopefully, you guys have enjoyed the whole ride with us. We have had an absolute blast getting to dissect this story uh, on such a like you know minuscule basis. I was I was looking. I think it takes about nine hours at standard speed to listen to all of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone on Audible, and we have over twenty hours of discussion on this particular book at this point in time. So wow. we we have quite literally doubled the length of time it would just take to listen to the book at regular speed. There you go. Um, so yeah, there you go. Hope hope you guys have enjoyed. Looking forward to next week's episode, which will be chapter one, the worst birthday. Oh yeah. Join us next time through the Gryffindor.